Well, thank you, Francesco. Thanks very much for the invitation to speak. Sorry, I uh, can't be there in person. Let me know if you have any trouble hearing me. And also, of course, let me know if you have any questions. So um, here's a drawing provided by one of my daughters. If you zoom in, you can see some equations. On the so here's a plan for the these lectures. At the beginning, I'll be discussing the general concept of symplectic resolutions. This plan roughly corresponds to the days of the talks, but maybe not precisely. Then I'll talk about symplectic duality. Then I'll speak about the Roberman Finkel construction of the Kluge Ramp. Um, then I'll speak about what it is as a special case of number three generalized outcome Grassmannian slices. And then time permitting quantizations of Coulomb branches, and in particular of these generalized affine Grassmannian slices, so which goes under the name of truncated shifted unions. Okay. So th there's a the plan. Um, as I say, it will roughly correspond to the, the lectures, but maybe not precisely. And um, there'll be two um, question answer sessions. The, the first one on Wednesday will be hosted by Michael McCree. And the topic of that will be hypertoric varieties. And the second one on Thursday will be hosted by uh, Yihao. Uh, sorry, if I'm misspelling your last name, you have. And the topic of um, this session will be on connections with physics. Well, and, and in particular, also about these generalized affine Okay, So let's begin the session. So let's begin today with the symplectic resolutions. So, there's, there's a famous quote from Akunkov from about 10 years ago, and he said something like, symplectic resolutions are the Lie algebras of the 21st century. And uh, hopefully I'll convince you today that there are very interesting objects of study. They have been quite, quite extensively studied in the 21st century. So let me begin. The definition at first glance looks a little, complicated, a lot of structures. So what is a symplectic resolution? So, and in fact, I'm going to point you to this slightly restricted class called conical symplectic So the following thing, so it's a, first of all, morphism of two, complex algebraic varieties, X and Y. Oh. I see some people saying there's some feedback. I did hear also a little bit of echo. Is it, maybe now people have muted themselves and it's better? Okay. Sounds better to me now, so, okay, great. Okay, so the conical symplectic resolution is a morphism of algebraic varieties. This map pi is, is a resolution of algebraic varieties, so it should be birational and projective. That's the first thing. Um, y is smooth. And, and usually I'll work over the complex numbers, so this is all over. Algebraic varieties over the complex numbers. Y is smooth, 
and carries an algebraic symplectic structure. Okay, uh, now Echo seems to be gone. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, let me know if anyone has any questions. Okay, great. So let's go again. So conical symplectic resolution, we have, it's a, it's a two algebraic varieties over the complex numbers uh, map between them, which is a resolution of singularities. So it's birational and projective. The space Y is smooth and symplectic. And the space X is affine and Poisson. So maybe I just remind you that this in particular, this means that the coordinate ring of X is a Poisson algebra. That means in addition to a multiplication, it carries a Poisson bracket. Which, which is something which satisfies Jacobi identity and also the Leibniz identity with respect to the multiplication. Okay. And more structure. This is, okay, so the up till now, that's what it means to be conical. I mean, a symplectic resolution. Now I'm gonna add the adjective conical. That means I have an action of C star on Y and on X. So it acts on both varieties and the morphism is compatible with the action. And the, the, this action of C star and X gives rise to a grading, a Z grading on the algebra of functions. And I demand that the nth graded piece is zero if n is less than zero and is C if n equals zero. So it's strictly uh, not, it's not negatively graded with C in degree zero. And in particular, this, this fact is equivalent to the geometric fact that the fixed points for this C star action is just a single point. And that the action of C star contracts X to this fixed point. So that's another piece of structure. And now yet one more piece of structure which somehow is not quite mentioned in the adjective. Sometimes people might impose a different word, but let me just say, I'll put another piece of structure without giving it a name exactly. So I want another action of a torus. So a torus, another algebraic torus, which will also act on the morphism X and Y. Oh, I should have mentioned here before that this scales the symplectic form. It's the symplectic form on Y. In terms of this Poisson bracket, it means that this Poisson bracket has degree one or degree two. I mean, sometimes you consider conical actions of weight one or conical actions of weight two. I'm not going to be too specific about it. Okay, but now I have another action of a torus, which is now preserves the symplectic form. In fact, it's a Hamiltonian action. And I'll demand not that this not that this contracts the space to a point that wouldn't be possible for an action which preserves the symplectic form but well I'll, what i will ask is that there's finally many fixed points for this torus action on y so this is a condition which is not always true but but often is true okay so that's a lot of structure the definition took a whole page so let's see some examples so even though it seems like a long list of structures, these things which satisfy this list of axioms is, are quite common and um, very interesting in, in geometric representation theory. So here's the first example, as we take the cotangent bundle of P1 mapping to the nilpotent cone of SL2. So what is that? Well, in, in pictures, it looks like this. It's, nuclear reactor in this ice cream cone. So this morphism collapses the P1 sitting in here. How does it look in, in matrices? So I think of the no point cone of SL2 as two by true matrices of trace zero and determinant um, zero. So A two by two matrices, trace A is zero and determinant A is zero. In terms of equations, those matrices look like W, U, V, uh, negative W. So that already we get trace zero and determinant zero, we get um, W squared equals U, V. And um, maybe, maybe W squared plus U, V equals zero, I suppose if I did correctly.
and this is um, the same as the as an algebraic variety to the quotient of C2 by the action of Z mod 2. And we think of T star P1 as a pair consisting of a matrix like this and a line. So L A is a matrix and L is a line point in P1. And, and the condition is that A of C2 is contained inside of L and A of L is zero. Right? That's just a way of describing this cotangent bundle. And so the fiber of this map, well, if A is a non-zero matrix, there's a unique such L, just it's a kernel. And if A is a zero matrix, that's here, this is a zero matrix sitting here. So if A is a zero matrix, well, there's no, any L will work. So we get this P1 fiber here. So that's our Y, and that's our X. Um, we have this uh, C star action, the conical action. Uh, Joel? Joel? Yeah. We have a yeah, question. Are yeah, yeah. so, uh, uh, the action of the torus and the C star should be uh, compatible or not? Uh, yeah, they commute. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So we have, um, in this case, the conical C star action just comes from scaling of the matrix, uh, scale, or, or equivalent scales in cotangent fibers. Matrix. And, and we have this Hamiltonian um, action of a t torus T, which um, well, you could say it's C star squared, or you could just say it's C star because part of the C star square will act trivially. Anyway, this Hamiltonian C star squared action, this um, uh, it, it acts just by acting on C2. Therefore on P1 and on the, and on the Nopon cone. Okay, so that's our first example. Okay, so this example, of course, admits many generalizations. So um, the first one, maybe they'll be like really relevant for us, will be the cotangent bundle of a projective space, say Pn minus one, which maps to the square zero m by n matrices of rank less than or equal to one. So that's our x, that's our y, it's resolution. And again, we have conical C star action, Hamiltonian torus action, as before. Um, of course, this, this itself admits many generalizations. Um, we could put here cotangent bundle of some flag variety. This is all under number two here. So we could put here some G mod P and it would resolve some P of G here would be any semi-simple group over the complex numbers. MP parabolic subgroup. Um, and, and this would resolve a, a null potent orbit closure. So I, I won't actually talk so much about this kind of thing. So I'm not going to go into much detail about it. So let me just put it in a bracket. <laughs> um, something that will be a bit more, a special case of this is more relevant for us is the cotangent bundle of the flag variety of SLN, so I'll write that in more detail, which resolves the no-potent cone of SLN. So here we have all n by n nilpotent matrices. And here the resolution is by a pair of a nilpotent matrix and a flag in, a, in the n-dimensional vector space. So V is the flag in an n-dimensional vector space. And this matrix and the flag are compatible in this way. So that's one, um, one class of examples. And once again, we have, um, maybe it's worth saying here, we have C star conical, which is given by scaling. 
and Hamiltonian torus action. Well, in this case, like the torus of whatever group we had, or in this case, C star to the n. This or C star to n minus one, if you like, this acts on the on the ambient CN. Okay. Another way this first example generalizes. So I pointed out that it was um, that this affine algebraic variety W squared plus UV equals zero can be thought of as C2 mod Z mod two. So another way we could generalize that is we can consider um, C2 mod gamma as our X. Let me write this a little differently. Take uh, gamma to be a finite subgroup of SL2. And then we have this Kleinian singularity, C2 mod gamma, that's our X, and it has a well-known resolution, C2 mod gamma tilde, that's our Y. And if we take, uh, if we take the zero point here, this, this, this map is, well, it's birational, and it's in fact an isomorphism away from this zero point, and over the zero point is a chain of P1s. Well, not necessarily a chain, a collection of P1s. And um, these finite subgroups of SL2C are classified by um, simply Lay's Dinkin diagrams. And so the, the, and the, the Dinkin diagram tells you the pattern of this P1. So this, this example here, I'm trying to show a pattern of P1s, like, well, I don't know how many I drew, seven or something, six, connected together in a chain. So this would correspond to the A6 Dinkin diagram. According to the graph, the diagram. And actually, uh, if you look at my the conditions that I wanted to satisfy, the only way to get the Hamiltonian torus action is if gamma is, is the group Z mod n. So um, to get some kind of torus acting here with finally many fixed points in gamma So it would not satisfy the last condition that I imposed the original if we didn't have if we didn't take Z mod n. So mostly we'll consider the case of C2 mod Z mod n type A singular. Another way to generalize the cotangent bundle of P1 and, and the cotangent bundle of other projective spaces is the theory of hypertoric varieties. So this is a beautiful combinatorial way of constructing many um, uh, symplectic resolutions. And it, it's a main source of like intuition in the, in the subject. So I'll explain a little bit about this, but for more detail, this will be the topic of, of Michael's session on Wednesday. So how do these hypertoric varieties work? Um, we start with a torus acting on a vector space Cn. So this is just a, some algebraic torus of rank like less, less than or equal to n. And we might as well assume it acts effectively for this purpose. And then we form the cotangent bundle of Cn, which is the same as Cn plus a dual copy of Cn. This um, has a moment map to the dual of the Lie algebra of our torus. So um, in, in coordinates, if this, we can say that this choose coordinates on Cn, well, it has natural coordinates. So this action is given by, say, some weights, chi1, chi n, so weights, or torus t. And then you can, using that, we can write down this, this moment map. And then we take the, this will be our moment map phi. Then we take the, zero pre-image of the moment map. And we can take a 
GIT quotient with the action of the torus. And in fact, we can take two different kinds of GIT quotient. We can take an affine GIT quotient or a projective DIQ quotient. Oops. So if we take the affine GIT quotient, we'll get the, the space X. And if we take the kind of projective GIT quotient, character theta or something, then, sorry, maybe I'll call this one chi. I shouldn't have put these chi's. Some weights. <laughs> Let's not worry about them. Um, and then, and then I'll get the space y. That's our x, and that's our y. Let's so let's see an example of this. So, so sub example of these hypertorque varieties. So the first example I want to take is I take C star acting on C n. So just our torus, just one dimensional, and this action is just by scaling. So then here I have. T star CN, and again, it's like CN plus CN. And here the action will be like scaling of weight one, and here scaling of weight minus one. So my torus will act in the opposite ways in the two copies. And I have this moment map, which is just given by taking the uh, like the AB to summation of AIBI. And then if I take the zero level of this movement map and I divide by this projective GIT quotient, well, this chi is just like the identity map. Maybe I should have pointed out. Uh, I want to find this projective GIT quotient, but it depends on chi, which is a character of the torus. So morphism from the torus to C star. So in this case, I just take the identity map. Then I will get the cotangent bundle of projective space. And then we'll map to the affine GAT quotient, which will be this rank square zero rank, square zero rank less than or equal to one matrices. In fact, this matrix A is made from these two vectors, A and B. It's like the, the, the product of A and B in the opposite order. Okay, so uh, that's, that's, that's one example. <laughs> and then the dual example. So this is our first appearance of symplectic duality. So what would be dual to C star acting on CN by scaling? Well, I mean, if you've never heard of this duality, you might not, it might not be obvious, but here's the dual. Is you, instead of taking, uh, you take, again, acting on CN, but rather than just C star, you take a big torus, like the set of T1, Tn's. Such that the product is one. So a rank N minus one torus. So here I had a rank one torus, here I have a co-dimension one torus. So I take this big torus acting on Cn. I do the same construction, I form the cotangent bundle of Cn, and it's I have its moment map. So its moment map this time will um, land again in the dual the Lie algebra here. So uh, not write it out explicitly, but I have a moment map here to the dual the Lie algebra. And then I take this Hamiltonian rejection. And what I get is our old friend C2 mod Z mod N result. This resolution of the Kleinian singular. Okay. So here we see a way of producing the cotangent bundle of Pn and the resolution of the Kleinian singularity using Hamiltonian reductions of an affine space by a torus action. And, and that's so hypertorque variety is just the generalization of this. So you start with any torus action on your vector space, take the cotangent bundle and take the Hamiltonian reduction. And, and sort of the ways of doing, I mean, not always will you get a smooth space, but the, 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 the classification of these actions, the classification of which ones give you smooth things and the study of the resulting things, spaces, though it's, that's all can be done combinatorially in this theory of hypertoric varieties.
Okay. So that's the next, that's a, and, and even if you don't know what this duality means yet, which you shouldn't because I haven't explained it yet, you can sort of see there's something uh, dual about these two things. Here I have a rank one torus and here I have a rank n minus one torus. Okay. So one more major class of examples, which will be important. In fact, there's two more major class of examples, but I'm gonna pause on introducing the, the last class of examples, which are the affine Grassmannian slices. I'm gonna go right here to the quiver varieties. So quiver varieties here, I was taking reductions by actions of tori. Now, instead of just tori, I'm gonna generalize it to products of GLN. So tori are products of C stars, now I'm going to consider products of GLNs. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to start with a, a framed graph. So what is that? I'm going to draw this picture. It looks a little like this. So it's a, it's a graph, a directed graph. So I didn't put any arrows here. So it looks like this. Some of the vertices are circles, some of the vertices are squares, it's important, and all the vertices have numbers. What I do with this graph, this quiver, I associate first a group, and my group is the product of the GLs of the circled vertices. So these are circles. And VI refers to the number in the vertex. So it's, G, it's a, just think of these numbers as being vector spaces of those dimensions. So in this case, I have GL3, GL4, and GL5. And then I build a big vector space, which I call N for some reason. And this vector space is just the direct sum of all arms around, along all edges in this graph. So which we could split in terms of Vs and, 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 and Ws. And my convention is that the, there's only arrows from squared ones to, to, to circled ones. So it ends up looking like this. So that's my N. And then I do something like what I did a few minutes ago with the hypertoric varieties. I double the vector space. I take its cotangent bundle. So again, it's just a vector space. So it's just n plus n dual. And you can think of n, the dual ones as thinking of, as you could think of it as doubling the graph, put arrows in both directions. And then uh, this thing admits a, a moment map to the Lie algebra of this torus. Um, if you think about this as being doubling the arrows, this moment map is just about com composing all possible following one arrow and following the opposite arrow back. So if we put in, then um, let me give these guys some names. Maybe I'll call A, this one B. Then this map is just uh, A I S B I S A I J B I J or something. Then this map is something like um, the sum over J of A I J. B I B J I plus A J I. I mean, not so. Um, B. Should not load. Okay. In other words, um, it's just the sum over all ways of going out and back from your vertex. So either you follow this one out and back, you go either you go out and back like this, or you go out and back like this. So just the sum of going all the ways out and back. Okay, so that's the, um, the MOM map. And then we construct this Nakajima curve variety. So this construction is due to Nakajima. We take the zero level of this moment map and we take the projective GIT quotient by this product of GLs. And here, chi, again, it's a map from 
g to c star and it's given by the product of determinants. So that's our syntax of resolution. Uh, maybe maybe a, a special case of a couple of facts about, well, one, one general fact, and then I'll, yeah, one general fact, and then a, a special case I just kind of discussed. So um, these W vertices, they didn't participate. Um, they were just sitting on the sidelines, but they, they sort of come into play right now that this guy will retain an action of the general linear group of those W vertices, in particular, we can consider the action of the torus inside there. So this torus will act, and that's the our, that's going to be our Hamiltonian torus that acts on this impedance resolution. Sorry, is there a question? Uh, what is the notation wi for? So I should maybe I should emphasize the these dimension vectors are called wi's. These ones are called vi's. It's just a convention. But the, I mean, these are just the integers I wrote over there and the integers are right here. So in this case, Vs are three, four, and five, and Ws is two, maybe zero, and seven. Um, here's a, a, a special case, which uh, is very nice. So if we just take the following quiver, so two, one, two, three, and so on, up till n, minus one, and then put an n-dimensional framing over there, is that quiver. The quiver variety produced by this construction is actually just our old friend, the cotangent bundle of the flat group. And how does it work? Well, it seems at first glance like a miracle, like here I had some <laughs> matrices, how did I get this flag? Well, you just compose everything up into, you know, up into this framing vector space. So maybe, maybe I'll do it in a, in a sh shorter example, then you'll see exactly how it works. In fact, let me do something slightly, well, let me do, let me do it slightly. So that's one example. I won't explain that one, but I'll explain this one, which works pretty much the same way. So I put just K and N framing vertex. So then I have matrix A, so my N here is just um, CK to CN. So just a K by N matrix. Then when I double it, I have two matrices. Oh, another one matrix going backwards, B. And if I take this Hamiltonian reduction, sorry, then, I, then my mode map condition is just the product. So, GLK takes A, B, better write the product in the right order. So first I want to use the matrix B, A and then the matrix B to get back to CK. So it's B, A. And then if I take um, the, the zero level, so then I'll be studying matrices like that with product zero in this order. Well, if and then when I take this projective GIT quotient by GLK, so G here is just GLK because I only have one circled vertex. If I take uh, in my notation before, V would be K, and W would be N, there's only one of each of them. If I take the, um, this Hamiltonian reduction, sorry, if I take this projective GIT quotient, then it's the same as restricting to pairs A, B like this, such that A is injected. This is maybe not a very obvious fact, but it's the true fact. And then modding out by the action of GLK. So if I restrict to the locus A, B where A is injected, then the image of A will be a k-dimensional subspace of CN. And then I'll also remember the A, B, and that'll be my endomorphism. So this space here, is isomorphic to the cotangent bundle of a Grassmannian. So, and again, I think of this cotangent bundle of Grassmannian as a pair W, uh, call it C. So W is a subspace of CN of degree K, I mean, dimension K, 
and C is this matrix um, map from CN to CN, W of C to zero, CN containing this. So, well, <laughs> uh, there is a there is question, a question uh, in the QA. Q &A. Okay, in the great. One second. CW is equal to zero, and, and uh, C of CN is contained in W. And, and this, to go from this pair AB to this WCN, this W is the image of A, and this C is the composition of A and B this way around. So that's uh, first B and then A. Go ahead, a question. Oh, I mean, I guess I need to read it, sorry. <laughs> is the direction from square N to circle N minus N? Sorry, I, I, I was maybe a little like uh, imprecise. It actually doesn't really matter what directions you put there on the arrows. Um, in the sense, it matters for the construction of this vector space N. So the definition of this vector space the definition of this vector space, the definition of this vector space n, that depends on the direction of the arrow. But once you go to this cotangent bundle, you double the arrows anyway, so it doesn't actually matter the direction of the arrow. And um, well, sometimes people usually pick some convention and stick to it, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't seem to be doing that. So it doesn't it doesn't matter too much. Maybe maybe usually better to write from v's to w's, but it doesn't really matter which direction. So here I wrote from v to w. Here again, I guess I wrote from v to w. Any other questions? Okay, great. So that's it. I mean, it's not it for the talk, but that's it for the examples of symplectic resolution. So let me just remind you that this long list of examples. So, so again, I'll just summarize this example. So things to always keep in mind. So cotangent bundle of, of P1, that's like the basic example. And this generalizes to cotangent bundle of flag varieties. It generalizes to C2 mod gammas. Finite resolution planning similarities. It generalizes to hypertorics, and it generalizes. Joel, to Joel, there's a big problem here. Your screen is completely messed up, so you should just wait a few minutes. Sorry. Sorry. Ah, uh, it just got better. Is it okay now? No, no, it 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 didn't stay better for very long. Wait, what's the the writing is messed up? I think up? it's on local problem on our side. Just the screen projector is, is messed, messed up. up. So, so we just, just scribble. scribble. We can't, I turned on a microphone in the room so you can stop. Yeah. Yeah. Just can I can call call. Yeah. <laughs> so we are very sorry. The story is that our video is messed up so nobody in the room can see what you're writing because you know the mathematical symbols are. So this, is, so this is the right time to ask questions, uh, also for the people over Zoom, <laughs> a great time. In, order, in order to avoid the uh, more awkward experiences. So, so the, people, the, people, the people in Zoom, can they see if everything fine? I'm just wondering. OK. Yeah, they can see, yes. OK. So give us a so if The microphone is on, right, Andre? Yes, yes. So if someone wants to ask a question also here, Okay, now maybe no. Now it started. No, but if he moves, I think it's gonna mess up. Can you please uh, scroll? No, it's completely frozen. The shell is swelling. Yeah, you see, it's frozen. Mm -hmm. Look. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, it's, it's for uh, yeah. Yeah. It's for everyone the same. I guess. You have someone else at the by distance. It's the same on your computer. Yeah, but then my computer is perfect. On your computer, it works. Yeah. Oh. So you may say bonjour, but uh, that's not appearing. <laughs> so, but there is another question. Let's see. Yeah, no, this was. Uh... Um, oh, okay. Ah. No, mm -hmm. uh, uh, can you? Can you? Yeah, but uh, you can. Francois, can you share? Yeah. Okay. Maybe we found a solution. 
So join a B. That's uh that's all for that. Uh... I just finished what I was saying. <laughs> Can I ask the questions? Yes, yeah. please go ahead. So what is the relationship between the symplectic duality and maybe its neurons? Are there any relationship between them? Like cohomology and stuff like that? Sorry, between symplectic duality and what? Uh, you know, for example, uh, for the symplectic duality, are there any relationship between, for example, cohomology between the space and its mirror? Oh, well, that's going to be the subject of like the next, you know, few hours. So ah, okay. <laughs> many, many, the short answer is there's many, many relationships, but we'll, we'll see some soon. Although I, I don't think I'll talk about some back duality until next time, but yeah, we'll see lots of relationships. I think next week can come next time. So oh, um, there was a question. What does this tilde mean here? So, well, it's just a shorthand. So, there's this Kleinian singularity, C2 mod gamma. Actually, I suppose I'll just zoom up. Let's go back up. So, there was a question. What is this C2 mod gamma tilde? So, it just means that there's this Kleinian singularity, C2 mod gamma. Well, it's just defined as the affine GAT quotient of C2 mod gamma. In other words, C2 mod gamma is by definition spec of the invariant functions. And then uh, it's a singular variety and it's called the Kleinian singularity. It has a kind of unique uh, minimal resolution, which is very well studied. So I just call it C2 mod gamma tilde. It can be constructed in other ways. Um, for example, I mean, can be constructed sort of, I don't know, yeah, more, I don't know, representation theoretically, let's say. And for example, in, in C2 mod Z mod N, it's constructed as this hypertoric variety right here. C2 mod Z mod N tilde is constructed as this hypertoric variety. There is also another question. Yeah. And, uh, and then you can uh, start because now we solve our problem. Great. But there is another question is, uh, you may Sorry. see in the Q and A. Ah, uh, yeah, the circles and squares, I think uh, exactly come from the physicists. Yes. Um, um, well, my last point was going to be, there's one more class of examples, which I'm not going to talk about just yet, which are called affine Grossmannian slices. Okay. And, and maybe I should mention, I mean, I didn't emphasize it so much, but there's also these cotangent bundles of other flag varieties, which I'm um, in general, not really going to talk about much in this series of talks. Okay, so, so we defined this general notion of conical symplectic resolutions. I gave you uh, lots of examples. By the way, um, I don't know if it's exactly considered a problem to try classify them, but maybe it's not believed that there's very many examples besides the ones I've listed. So this is almost like some kind of complete list of examples. There's a vague statement, but uh, I don't know of any precise statement like that. But. Um, uh, one thing you might you might ask, what about uh, this is way off topic? But people have tried to like classify all possible um, symplectic resolutions which are of this form, so C n mod or T star C n or something mod gamma or gamma is finite. So that that's something that's something people have studied, tried to classify, and I think I think the classification of those those ones is complete. Okay, there's a few besides these two mod gammas. So there's a few more things like that which don't fit on this list. So it's definitely this is not a complete list, but maybe it's close to a complete list. Okay, so these are some examples. So what are the general properties? Why is this interesting things to study these symplectic resolutions? So, so I'm gonna try to explain some general theorems about conical symplectic resolutions. And basically these results are due to Khaled and, and Namikawa from roughly speaking, the early 2000s, like 2000 to 2010. Maybe some of the results were obtained a bit earlier. Okay, so the first result is that um, X um, has a partition
into a finite, finite partition. And these, um, okay, so over some pieces X alpha, I'll write alpha and I, this is finite. And what, what, what's, what's good? These X alphas are all symplectic. So there's a Poisson structure on X and the, these X alphas are the symplectic leaves of that Poisson structure. And they're also smooth. I should say that before I said they were symplectic. And also this map pi um, from y to x is, um, well, maybe at the very least, uh, I don't know what the right result is, but the, 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 it's like locally trivial over x alpha. <laughs> no, that's exactly true. But at the very least, the, the, the push forward of the constant shape is constant over each x alpha. Um, let, let me not write this. Let me write something more precise. <laughs> Since that's a fine writing things that are not quite, maybe not true. Okay, so if we can check the push forward of this constant sheet, it will decompose in the following way. Um, well, it's going to be. Uh, let me ignore this. Let me come back to this a little bit. Number two, the map from y to x. Um, is semi-small. So semi-small, what does it mean? It means that the dimension of the fiber product y with y over x is equal to the dimension with y or x. So that means that the fibers are not too big. In particular, the dimension of the fiber over some point x alpha little x, that's supposed to be a little x alpha in big x alpha, dimension of that fiber is equal to one half the co-dimension of the stratum. Maybe less than, I think in most cases it's actually equal. And together what one and two will mean is that if I take it, that I can take the push forward of the constant sheet, on y. So this is a complex of constructible sheaves on x, which captures the information of the cohomology of the fibers of the map from y to x. And this will decompose into a direct sum over these alphas of the IC sheaf of x alpha tensor, the top homology of the fiber f alpha. Here, f alpha is pi inverse of x alpha. And I should say one thing here I'm assuming, really, I should be writing a bit more complicated statement, but just to make my notation simpler, and since it's true in the most examples I'm interested in, I'm assuming that actually x alpha is simply connected. This is, for example, not true for the cotangent bundle of the flag variety outside of type A, but it is true for the potential model of flag variety in type A. So we have a, a decomposition of the push forward of this constant shape. And, and sorry, to be a bit more precise, I suppose I should put a cohomological shift here. Excuse me. Yeah? Do you want to take the closure when you take IC? Well, by the IC sheaf of some, some stratum, I mean the, the intermediate extension of its constant sheaf. So yes, you could say it's the okay, same as the IC sheaf of the closure. It's just, yeah. yeah. You, you, you asked for X alpha to be smooth. That's why I asked. Yeah, so I really mean the, the we could put a bar here. I'm just simplifying the notation a little bit. But yeah, I mean the intermediate extension of the constant sheaf on the X alpha. Okay, so um, so we'll we'll come back to this decomposition shortly. But when I'm done, but you should take away from this part that has beautiful topological properties. This map from y to x. Okay. Next point is the existence of a deformation.
So our original map y to x fits into a family. Sorry, it's scripty y to scripty x. How does it work? So this scripty y maps to the a vector space, which is which is identified with H two of y, the second cohomology of y with complex coefficients. And the script dx maps to h2 of y modulo the action of a finite group w, which is called the Namikawa Weil group. In such a way that the fibers of these maps over zero give you x and y. This seems a little weird, but let me explain an example and it will become clear. So here we take the cotangent bundle of a five variety mapping to nilpotent cone. And as I mentioned before, these are pairs A V such that A of VI is contained in VI minus one and A is nilpotent. And then I can construct, I can embed this in a bigger space. So this can become my scripty Y, which is in this case usually called G tilde. And in this case, this deformation is called the growth and deep simultaneous resolution usually. And here I put pairs A, V, where A is not necessarily nilpotent, and I just have the condition A of VI is contained in VI. So then I can just remember the matrix A. Sorry, then I can not just remember. Yeah, that's this arrow. And this nilpotent cone, of course, is contained inside the whole Lie algebra GLN, so all matrices. A. So this map takes A, V to A. And the space of matrices maps to the T mod W, which is just taking the characteristic polynomial of the matrix. And this thing maps to T, which is CN, which is just recording the eigenvalues of A, but we get to actually record them in order because we can just take the action of A on each quotient. So this goes to the a acting on vi over vi minus one. So I have a flag, which is invariant under A. So uh, A will act by a scalar on each quotient vi over vi minus one. So that's this growth and the simultaneous resolution. And that's what happens in general. So my original symplectic resolution is here and it extends to this family. And um, if I put, Take the fiber. If I take impose zero character polynomial, of course I get back no potent cone, and, and that's the, the general picture. Um, so why, when you see this, you might ask, where did this H two Y come from? It seems a little, uh, I don't know, surprising. But he here's an explanation. So if we pick. Um, if we take theta in H2 of Y, and we, I don't know if this has a good name, but maybe just temporarily I'll call it uh, C or something. And then we take C inverse of theta, let me call that Y theta, so the fiber over this theta. Um, then actually Y theta is isomorphic to Y, well, not as an algebraic variety, but as a as a smooth manifold, not as an algebraic variety. In fact, in fact, for most for most values of theta, y theta is actually affine as an algebraic variety. But in any case, it is isomorphic as a smooth manifold, and we can use that to identify the second cohomology of y theta with the second cohomology of y, and Inside the second cohomology of y theta, we have we can consider the symplectic form of y theta, and thereby we can map it to a class in H two of y. And the like compatibility of this diagram is that this class of the second cohomology of this the class of this symplectic form is actually uh, theta. So, for example, if we took theta to be zero. Um, the class of the symplectic form on y is zero, which is not surprising because um, I, I didn't say this above, but this, this y only 
its cohomology is only in the, it only has KK cohomology only down the center of the Hodge diamond. So this symplectic form automatically would be in the two zero part of the cohomology. So it automatically must be zero. So that's somehow, this, that's somehow the reason for this appearance of this H2 of Y. So, so for this reason, um, this map is sort of a period map. It may be precisely a period map. Anyway, I, don't, I don't know much about the theory of period maps and dimensions. Okay, so this is a, another beautiful feature of symplectic resolutions. They always come with this deformation of algebraic varieties. And the, another feature that they come with is that they always come with, uh, by the way, what time? How much? Um, I guess there was a couple interruptions. So maybe I go another five minutes or something. Is that is that good, Francesco? I think also. I mean, maybe also 10 minutes, I don't know. Yeah, you can do it even more, I think, if you need it. Yeah, I mean, we interrupt to you so many times so that, uh, I mean, I know. I, I guess know. 10 minutes is a size, you know? So, yeah, 10 minutes. Okay. I think, in a, in, okay. Great. So the next feature is the existence of a universal quantization. So I think this will be the last thing I'll, I'll talk about, but it will probably take the 10 minutes. Okay, so what does it mean a quantization? So I mentioned before that this, let's start just um, algebra, purely algebraically. So this coordinate ring of X, I mentioned before, this is a Poisson algebra. So a quantization of X. is uh, uh, algebra over uh, a polynomial ring in some variable usually called h bar, quantization parameter. And, and sometimes this would be um, the power series in h bar, but one slight advantage of this adding this axiom of it being a conical symplectic resolution is that we can, its quantization will actually live um, over polynomials in CH, but it's not a very big deal. Okay, so a quantization of X is a CH bar algebra A such that um, if I take the quotient of, if I specialize H bar to zero, so take A mod H bar A, this will be isomorphic to C at X um, as a Poisson algebra. So, to make this precise, I need to tell you why the left-hand side is a Poisson algebra. So it's an algebra just from this algebra structure. Now this A is gonna be a non-commutative algebra. And this the Poisson structure on the left side is gonna represent the first order non-commutativity. So the Poisson bracket of A bar, B bar. So here, A and B are elements in A, A bar and B bar are elements in A mod H A. This is by definition, we form the commutator of A and B in A, and then pick this. Uh, divide by H bar, and then take the bar. Okay. Another way of saying this is like, anyway, sorry. This thing is, this commutator is necessarily divisible by H bar because um, AB minus BA are, are equal, so. You know. So this uh, in C, since CX is commutative, then the products are equal in CX. So the first order non-commutativity is divisible by H bar. And then, uh, then we take the class of that and we get this Poisson bracket. So that's the definition of the Poisson bracket. And I would like that this, um, that this Poisson bracket agrees with my original Poisson bracket on CX. Okay, so that's the notion of quantization. Mm -hmm. And um, then we could, this could be a, a quantization of Y. We would define a similar way, but just in, in the sheaf of algebras. Y is a sheaf. Um, 
it's in the similar sense that this is isomorphic to the structure sheet for Y. Um, so then, uh, so then I would like to say that there exists a unique universal quantization, just like our universal deformation. So this again will be parameterized by the um, universal quantization. Again, parameterized by this H two. Or if we work, um, maybe I'll just write the statement for X because it's slightly simpler. So it's used for quantization of X parameterized by the same H two of Y mod this W. So this is a, so this is going to be an algebra A. Um, and, uh, not too many different kinds of scripty A's. Okay, this one will be another scripty A. Um, and it will contain the coordinate ring of this H2 of Y mod W. So So as the center, this is the center. They end for any data in this spec of the center, which is the same as H2 of Y on W. Um, I can take the reduction of A by this ideal generated by this theta. And uh, this is a quantization of X. And, and moreover, every quantization of X arises this way. Sorry, I guess to be a little bit more precise, um, I should say every quantization of X that extends to a sheaf of quantizations on Y arises this way. So let's look at example again. And we'll take again this cotangent bundle of the flag variety as our, our example. So, so X is this no quote and cone. Y is the cotangent bundle of this flag variety. And then uh, let's say G, G is the, the algebra GLN or SLN, right? maybe SLN for simplicity. Then this universal quantization A will be the uh, H bar version or the Reese algebra of the universal enveloping algebra of SLN. This is like the Reese algebra of the usual universal enveloping algebra of SLN. Or if you like, it's the algebra generated by X, by, by elements of, of SLN and then relations like X, Y, um, y x is equal to h bar the lead bracket of x and so if we um and this thing contains the center of the universe enveloping algebra sn which can be identified with um cn minus one under t model the cartan model so um so in particular, if we like specialize to the, anyway, you can see if you set um, H bar to zero, then, then A will become this universal commutative deformation, the coordinate ring. will become this same spec of the symmetric algebra of SLN, which is just this universal coordinate, which is just SLN itself, which is the universal commutative deformation of SLN. Okay, so this, um, so yeah, yeah, I could, I could have said that here as well. That, that for this universal quantization A, if we take the any 
fiber of it, if we specialize theta, we get a quantization of X. And if we, special, if we don't specialize theta and just take A mod HA for the whole A, then it's the coordinate ring of this X tilde that I wrote about. Um, now, last point I just want to make, I guess, before we stop, is that so there's like two kind of notions of quantization. This thing here, which is called a formal quantization. So this CH bar version, well, that's called usually a formal quantization. And then there's also a filtered quantization. Then if we take this and we specialize H bar to be one, so we take A, what uh, a h bar minus one, then we get the filtered quantization. So we get instead of filtered algebra, whose associated graded is our original Poisson algebra. So for example, in the example, we could take um, this u g and uh, u h bar g and then set h bar equals one, and then we'd get just the usual UG, you know, so open algebra. So oftentimes people study these filtered quantizations instead of these formal quantizations, but usually you can pass back and forth between the two things. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll stop there. That's thanks, John. Any question from the audience or from the people over Zoom? Please go ahead. Yes, I have a question. Uh, when you defined uh, Nakajima quiver varieties, uh, you took some chi, which was the product of determinants. Uh, yeah. of the, so if you choose another chi, uh, another character for the group, uh, can you obtain interesting examples also? Um, yeah. Um, so, um, um, that's a good question. It's actually sort of a good general question. Okay. So, um, let, let, let me, let me actually answer the question sort of more generally and then I'll come to this specific thing. So, so I started with X, Y as my like starting data. The symplectic resolution. One interesting thing one can do is to um, start with just x, and then and then try to find all possible y's. Maybe multiple different symplectic resolutions of x. Um, one reason why you might want to do this is because we'll see soon that this data of these different symplectic resolutions has a sort of meaning on the symplectic dual side. So for that reason, it's kind of interesting. And so in the case of an X constructed as a Nakajima quiver variety, or more generally as any kind of Hamiltonian reduction. So this, oh, sorry, I'll write, I didn't actually introduce this notation, but let me write it here for the first time. I'll write three lines that I mean the this symplectic reduction. So what I mean by that is I take the in the moment map image and then take the the JIT quotient. So that means and actually this zero, in fact, when I write this notation, it's maybe helpful to write two pieces of notation here, maybe um, uh, maybe. I, which could be, well, which would be this zero. Okay, in this case, it's just zero, zero. So. <laughs> Don't need to invent some new letter. So I just take this. And then as you, as you said, we could take, um, um, and change the, the um, this guy. So this would be, take the zero level of the moment map still, but then take the different character. Chi. So, so as I mentioned before, usually this would be the product of determinants, but you could do something else. And yeah, if you do that in the case of Nakajima varieties, or more generally for these um, symplectic reductions like this, 
yes, you could obtain other symplectic resolutions. And certainly there are some examples where you get interesting spaces this way. I'm not, I mean, I know the people in the audience much more expert than me, but for, for example, um, in the case where you are considering Hilbert schemes, maybe Hilbert schemes of points on, on, uh, on C2 mod gammas, you can get these different versions of the Hilbert scheme this way as by, by varying this, this chi. And, and, but this brings up a different point, which maybe I should have mentioned earlier. You can also vary the, this parameter, the level of the mode map, so which I'm writing here, or here, here. You can vary that thing, and that's going to be responsible for this um, deformation that I explained earlier. So this deformation of the quiver variety, this universal deformation from the theorem of Kaleida and Amikawa, that's going to come from varying that, that, that zero to other, to other, um, to other moon map parameters. So thanks for the question. But yes, this study of different possible symplectic resolutions of a given symplectic singularity, this X is called a symplectic singularity. We have also a question in the Q and A window. So if you can check it, or I can read it for you. But I guess you can. Yeah, um, does the deformation in part three of this theorem carry a plus one structure with the leaves given by the various y theta? Uh, yeah, I think so, yes. Is there a global plus one structure on the whole thing? Somehow I never thought about this precisely because I always thought about, but yeah, I think so, yes. Any other question or comment? Okay, no one is also, okay, so maybe we can thank uh... So thank you, Joel, again.